good morning so i am going to uh, get back to the demo on laplace's equation what we'll do today is i'll uh, start with the same 5 by 5 grid that is we'll have three interior grid points last time i don't know whether you realized it or not but we were doing jacobi iterations just so that you realize that i was doing jacobi iteration right it was simultaneous relaxation all the points were changed in one shot okay that's basically what was happening we'll also try to see whether we can do gauss seidel okay so we'll do that on a 5 by 5 system and uh, 5 by 5 grid basically remember gives you 3 by 3 interior grid points so the actual system of equations that you're solving is a 9 by 9 system of equations so we will do that with uh, say a with that 5 by 5 system and then maybe we'll try something larger right and for the larger one i'll basically use uh, a package not package but a program that i've already written so that i don't sit down and we can do it manually i mean it doesn't matter i can write the program here it's not a big deal uh, maybe even for the larger one i will just i will just do it by do it by hand it's not it's just averaging right then if you have time today we will also do sor i don't know whether you have tried looking at sor right but uh, i already have a, a program written for sor for finding the optimal omega value uh, it's not a, not in to aid in finding the optimal omega value right it it doesn't actually hunt for the it doesn't do an optimization it doesn't solve an optimization problem okay so that's as far as that goes the other thing is if you have tried sor right so that is remember it was over relaxation but it was still successive over relaxation it was for the successive iteration that is for the gauss seidel okay my suggestion is try to find out what happens if you use a relaxation parameter with jacobi iteration just for the fun of it just see what happens if you try right if you try using a relaxation parameter with the original jacobi iteration algorithm that we came up with is that fine that's okay so just try to find out what happens and uh, we will revisit that question what i just suggested now we will revisit it a few weeks from now i'll come back to that point a few weeks from now okay so i'm starting off i python when when you use it of course you don't have to do this uh, no color stuff i mean uh, i'm doing no color simply because the red that comes here doesn't come up well on the video okay that's the only reason why i'm shutting off color i just wanted to show you that as a difference between last class and this class just so that we don't run into any confusion okay so we'll set it up quickly so let me uh, just to so that's the that's the plotting utility and this uh, package maya we just so that you know is built on top of uh, another package called visualization toolkit which is a c++ package so if you want to access any of these 3d plotting utilities functions right either in c or c++ you can easily write a program and tie it to the visualization toolkit it's called vtk the library is called lib vtk okay i'll just type it out so that you know what it is i'm not going to the library is called lib vtk what maya v does is it places a layer of an interface between python and the vtk toolkit the visualization toolkit that's basically what's happening so all the visualization because i i had a question in the last class about visualizing what tools do we use if you're writing programs in c and c++ and so on right so fundamentally all the visualization programs are basically written in c c++ fortran right and what you see here in python is normally a python interface to an existing program in fortran so there are a lot of lot of packages out there that you can use okay so grace plot for instance is a front end to something called uh, grace which has a history of its own either xm grace or xm gr or whatever it is so you can you can uh, you can try to interface directly to grace okay you can try uh, a package that i like to use uh, is called ygl i'll just type it again because uh, this this package uh, basically tries to emulate the silicon graphics graphics library called gl right so 
which uh, which is very easy to use. So you can try. I mean, as I said, there, but there are lots of packages out there that you can do use. And finally, of course, as a suggestion, if you can put a dot on the screen, and this is relevant to what we are doing on this course, right? So this screen that you are seeing right up front is uh, what I am using on my laptop is 1024 by 768 dots. If you can put a dot on the screen, you can draw a line on the screen. You understand? And if you can draw a line on the screen, you can plot. Okay, is that fine? Okay, so there is always uh, always ways by which you can plot, right? There is always ways by which you can plot. Uh, maybe at a maybe in a later class I'll show you do a, a few demos of various plotting packages that you can use and so on. Okay. Uh, the other part, as far as programming goes, before I get into the demo itself, because of the nature of this course, you are writing all your programs in, right? I encourage you to write your programs in C, C plus plus, or Fortran and so on. But when you eventually get to code development. Right. So the way I do my code development is very often I start my initial code development in Python. Is that fine? Right. And then as and when, so if I have my program functionally correct, right, the program is functionally correct. You understand what I am saying? It functions properly. Then I start through a process of writing either C routines, Fortran routines or C++ routines to replace elements of that Python program with something that runs faster as required. So as a consequence, I am able to sit, when I am when I'm in this process, I am always able to interact through Python, interact with my program, it is always interactive. And if it is batch, then I use my Python again to write a script to run the batch program. That is the idea. So in a sense, using uh, Python as a programming language to steer large programs, that is the, that is what you are looking for. That is the ability that you want to get to, right, at some point in the future. But right now, my suggestion is, if you want to try to do that, do that. But my suggestion is uh, keep writing programs in C, C++, Fortran until you make sure that you are totally comfortable doing that. Okay, let us get on with it. So I am going to uh, import numpy because I need, uh, I need an array, right. So I just like last time, I will create a 5 by 5 grid. going from point 0 0.5j. I think by now the syntax is most probably, I hope, familiar to you. 0 0.2, 1.2 and that should create for me a 5 by 5 mesh, okay. That should create for me a 5 by 5 mesh. Those are the two things that we looked at in the last class. And of course, as a consequence, just like I did last time, I will say, P is x star x minus y star y, okay, right. And uh, we will we will set to zero. Okay. And of course, at this font size, it looks a bit funny, but you can see that they uh, do the right thing. Phi of minus one, comma one, colon one, minus one, colon. Oh, sometimes, and since that doesn't make sense, we'll do the right thing. Right, which is what I was telling you. <laughs> this is what I was telling you. The reason why I do this is yes, I make mistakes. We all make mistakes, right? So that I, I am not trying to make it a. I am not trying to make it perfect. Now you can see that all the interior points are zero. That's fine. Okay. Let me just type up because this this helps me uh, at a later point. So phi of one colon minus one comma one colon minus one equals. What is it? Today I will get a little lazy, 0 0.25 times what we have, zero colon minus 2 that shifted to the left plus
shifted to the right plus shifted up or shifted down plus that is shifted up fine. So, that in fact will give me that in fact will give me the first iteration okay is that fine everyone. So, we can and we can go through this iteration what if I wanted to do Gauss Seidel instead. So, we can go through this iteration what I will do is I will quickly I will just quickly redo this. So, I say reset my phi I set it equal to 0 okay because I have I need to store I need to store my error error uh, shall I say Jacobi equals that okay fine how many iterations shall I do 10, Ten iterations 50 iterations 50 iterations or let us do 100 iterations just to be I in range 100 okay I hope I have got everything right. So, I will just uh, copy copy that out see if that works whatever has to be deleted we will delete okay. error is x squared minus y star y minus phi phi i is that fine. I will just square it. I will take the sum. So, E r r dot append fine I could possibly even take the square root of that n p dot square root. Sum of the squares is that fine this should give me what I want and did I make a mistake ERRJ. So, when you get clever that is what happens ERRJ let me set up my phi again please bear with me. ERR j okay that is fine okay. So, e r r j seems to have a lot of zeros and way up there somewhere so obviously the suggestion for 10 or 15 iterations was pretty good pretty good pretty good suggestion and uh, the interesting thing is that the error afterwards is 0 is identically 0 okay. So, it is actually possible that two iterates get the same it converges to the same value you need to think about what that means in this context. So, what about Gauss Seidel I want to do Gauss Seidel what would Gauss Seidel give me I set phi x phi as x squared minus y squared. So, I, I let me create a E r r g for Gauss Seidel I set phi is x squared minus y squared I set the make sure that the initial guess is right okay and in Gauss Seidel what changes something here changes. So, in Gauss Seidel I will have to I cannot do that uh, phi I you know I cannot do that one whatever blah blah blah. So, I have to let me let me I have to actually iterate through the whole thing right I have to actually iterate through the whole thing. So, what I will do is oh, 
what I will do is let me just type it up for i n range 100 yeah what do we want to do now for j in range 1 comma 4 for k in range 1 comma 4 you have already done this this is most probably a hassle but anyway it is okay phi of i comma j equals 0 0.25 times phi of okay as I said this is most probably the last time I will bother you by writing this uh, j comma k I have to say wake up Ramakrishna j plus 1 comma k plus phi of j minus 1 comma k yeah you will have to plus phi of j comma k plus 1 plus phi of j comma k minus 1 is that okay everyone and it is updated I am using the same array so it is updated immediately okay. So that is as far as that loop is concerned do I need it to need to do anything else there I do not need to do anything else there. So that is for the first for loop that is for the second for loop so ERR <coughs> equals x star x minus y star y minus phi I am just copying from above as I said just bear with me I do not want to make a mistake here n p dot square root of what is that fine okay so now we can plot these two and see what they look like if you want to just see r r g a lot of zeros okay now we can plot these two so from grace plot I import my grace plot I create the plotting utility cancel and what do I want to plot dot plot okay two things look very similar as I have always said use a log scale so go to a log scale apply I do not know why it went to 10 power minus 4 1 e minus 16 you want 10 power minus 16 it seems to just okay fine and uh, as I had indicated earlier as I had indicated earlier Gauss Seidel converges faster than right Gauss Seidel converges faster than Jacobi iteration and it sort of if you squint at it it does look as though it is twice as fast on a log scale the slope does look as though it is twice as fast is that fine is that okay right. So I am not going to say how far down it goes it is going to suddenly drop to 0 right that was very clear. So one of the things of course what I normally do is I do not just allow the program to run in the background I usually plot this graph while the program is running so that you only look at the graphical output rather than what I will do is why do not why do not we run a 101 by 101 or something of that sort we will run a, a big, big one we'll run a big one. So 
I will recreate this. So, I will just basically say uh, x comma y is uh, Hundred and one, what do you want? One oh one is fine, one oh one, one oh one. So that gives me a hundred and one by hundred and one grid, okay. And everything else should actu actually work as it is because there is nothing in there that was specific to the number of grid points except for the Gauss seidel. We have to be a bit careful. So, what I will do is I will make this uh, E R R. J equals. I'll just overwrite it. It doesn't matter. Or maybe we can make it one not one either way. Go back to the. Go back to the Gauss Seidel. Uh, I'm sorry, Jacobi iteration. So that should do Jacobi iteration for us. Is that fine? J should be one oh one. Is that fine? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Something? I mean, X and Y. Why would they upgrade work? Why do you get such a such a matrix? One one where uh, in column 0 to 1 and the other one rows. It's all right. Well, they basically if you think about the uh, x y coordinate system at any given point, I have an x comma y, right. So, that m grid is essentially generating for me the array of x's and y's that represent the mesh underlying grid. Does that make sense? I can go to the board, maybe, yeah, it is fine. <coughs> we will see if it shows, yeah. So, essentially, what we are doing is no, no, it is fine, it is okay. Essentially, essentially, what essentially what we are saying, essentially, what we are saying is so this is 0, comma 0, this is what I am generating, right. So, this is 0, comma in this case uh, 0 0.3, 3, 3, 1 third. 0, 0.66 approximately, right. So, the x matrix consists of all the x's and the y matrix consists of all the y's, right. So, if you are if you are if you are somewhere in between, so this would be 0 0.66, 0 0.33 and so on. So, the x matrix consists of all the x entries and the y matrix consists of all the y entries, okay. That is basically what it does for you. Is that fine? Yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, we will. So let's get back to this. I think this code is fine, as it stands. So if I run this now, it should give me okay. And we did this a hundred times. Is there any chance anything would have happened? Hundred times. Do you want to run it longer? Okay, why don't we why don't we repeat the process? I will just make this. Uh, I will just make this G. Repeat the process for Gauss Seidel. And Gauss Seidel, you remember, I have to change quite a few things. I have to make this E R R G, one o one. And I have to change the limits to 100. Is that fine? Okay. And that takes a little longer because now we are sort of looping through. I am not using the inherent uh, iteration capabilities of NumPy or the uh, matrix abilities of M M numpy but uh, doing it myself manually in python okay so g dot plot 
E R R J one O one. Data has non positive values. What happened? Let us try ER or G, maybe I have made a mistake somewhere. Yeah, both have non positive values. What is x? x is a 101 by 101 matrix. We just wanted to make sure that was right. How is that possible? Hmm? How is it possible for uh, a square root to get a non positive value? It does not make sense. Try that one more time. Make sure I have not made a mistake anywhere. I have initialized 5, I set it equal to 0. iterations but of course that should make a difference just in case there is some issue there I will just do that as you can see even a thousand iterations if you use numP it is quite fast and uh, let me plot that just to make sure that I am not going to, I am going to get the same thing then we will just have to go on. Data has non positive value, I still do not get it but anyway it is okay, it does not matter. The point that I want to, the real really the critical point that I want to make out here, right is first the blue line which is uh, gauss Seidel does seem to converge faster still than Jacobi iteration one thing good but the bad thing is which we have which is what we expect that the rate of convergence is quite slow right look at what 5 by 5 is doing down here and look at what my gauss seidel is doing up uh, gauss jacobi is doing up there it's going to take forever for it to get down to a small enough uh, value that is uh, 10 power minus 6 or 10 power minus 16 is what we did in the other one. Am I making sense? Is, it, is that okay? Right. So the convergence is actually extremely slow. So just as a uh, let me let me do then a uh, I'll just restart this just to be clear clear that there are no threads running and so on. Let's just uh, now do SOR or something of that something a little different. Okay. Right, and we'll try to see whether we can animate the code while it runs. So from maybe I could have done it with the earlier thing, but it doesn't matter. Okay, just to be. Fine. Right. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll do maybe we'll do one other thing. What we will do is we'll see how this how these iterations go. Uh, I just wanted to show you that 
in the last class I show I use Maya V to draw contour plots. I just wanted to show you that you can actually do surface plots. Okay, so why don't I why don't I just do that? So I'm going to re redo the 101 by 101 grid. I created the 101 by 101 grid, right? P is x star x minus y star y. I don't know how many of you have tried uh, using Maya V so far, but it's relatively straightforward to use. So what I do is I say V equals m lab dot surface x comma y comma phi. This is to show you what the initial solution looks like, and that should generate something that looks like that and you are like what is that. Now that one of the things that I like about one of the things that I like about uh, Maya V is that you can interact with it okay. So let me maximize it or maximize it okay. I am going to add a, I am going to add a legend to it. Show legend, so we can see what it is. So it goes from minus one to plus one, and the coordinate system is at the bottom left-hand corner. If you can't see the coordinate system, I'll make that larger. Okay, the coordinate system is at the bottom left-hand corner, right? Fine. So this is the solution that we are expecting, right? So if you are saying, wait a minute, what is this? What is this? Okay, let me put an outline list like I did last time. And as I said, the thing that I like about it is that you can interact with it, right? So you can see from where the coordinate system, or from in fact from the fact that the solution is zero zero at this far corner, tells you that's x equals zero, y equals zero, basically, right? So and along this diagonal, along this diagonal, x equals y, so the solution is zero. So here it's a positive value, right? And here it's a negative value. Fine. It goes from plus one to minus one. So what happens when I set my solution? When I initialize the solution, that's that is the final solution. That's what we are supposed to get. Okay. If I just so that you see what's happening here, most probably you already know what's happening. I set it to zero point zero. That is our initial condition, okay. Our initial condition, except at the boundary where it is x squared minus y squared, everywhere else it is 0. That is our initial condition. Is that fine, everyone? Okay. So now, uh, now that we know that Gauss Seidel and Jacobi, we can actually see the solution evolve. So, what we will do is I will say, uh, let us do Gauss Seidel. To Jacobi, okay. For i in range, Jacobi is faster. Right? Go side a little slower, which for the sake of a demo is better. But anyway, uh, how many how many iterations do you want me to do? At the rate at which it was going, most probably five thousand iterations or something is most probably whatever. Five thousand iterations. Okay. Fine. Let's see if we can find the Jacobi. Control R P H I. I will just search back. Okay, that is Jacobi iteration. Is that fine, everyone? Okay. So, and I am going to plot only the phi. So, we have computed the phi v dot m lab scalars equals that phi. Let's run it, and you can see the solution evolving. And my computer is having problem. It's not going to rescale till I get to the last word. Okay, that's fine. So all you can make out, so this uh, 5000 
is quite a lot all you can make out is that flat portion seems to be diminishing at a rather slow rate and it is really going to take for almost ever in fact on the on the video itself I do not know whether this will be visible this is going to take forever to it is going to take forever to converge so it looks like even 5000 may not quite make it right you can see that little grey spot in the in the middle you can see that little grey spot in the middle diminishing and it is going towards the solution remember this is Jacobi right Gauss-Seidel will basically run twice as fast okay and uh, that is basically it so essentially the thing that you can do is that you can visualize you can visualize as I said maybe I should not have minimized it but you can visualize this code running as the code evolves it is actually possible for you to look at the solution right and uh, remember that just because on the screen it looks close to the solution does not mean that it is close to the solution the screen resolution is very small is that fine okay so this is these are some skills that possibly I am not I am only showing you the tools being used these are some skills that I think you should try to acquire that you are able to visualize a that you are able to visualize your data b that you are able to do it while your code is actually running right there are sometimes especially if you are going to do it with a scripting language like python or something of that sort there is a certain advantage to being able to interact with the code that you allow it to finish executing a uh, certain number of time steps or certain number of iterations or whatever it is and then come back and interact with the code okay fine so that patch is almost gone so actually at uh, 5000 it seems to be quite close mm, maybe 5000 was uh, on the large side anyway let us see fine okay Meanwhile, are there any questions? Let me see if I maximize this whether it will, if I give it time it will. So even if I try to interact with it right now because my, uh, because it is completely tied. If you think about it, 101 by 101 is a 10,000 by, is a, it's 10,000 unknowns. We're solving a 10,000 by 10,000 system, and we're doing 5,000 5, iterations. That's a lot of calculations. So it's also a good idea to do the computation as to how many operations we are performing beforehand, before getting into it, like I just did right now. Maybe I should have just said 1,000 instead of 5,000. Anyway, it's okay. It doesn't matter. It should be close to completion. So the other uh, point of course is that if you try to do this 5000 uh, iterations directly in C if you have already done this you would have most probably seen a lot faster than this okay so that is the big advantage of doing it in C or C++ or Fortran. So you get you pay a price for the ability to interact with the code I am tempted to just kill it maybe I will just kill it okay fine let us get back we will start Python again. Now we will do, we have just enough time to do SOR. So I have a Laplace equation solver that I have already written and SOR basically what it does is it is going to run SOR for me for that Laplace equation solver. Right now it is hardwired for a 41 by 41 grid okay, it is hardwired for a 41 by 41 grid. So I will create a something that will run SOR for me okay and it is very it has very simple it has very simple way to do it. So what does this do let me let me uh, what does run SOR do what am I doing what run SOR does is it is going to run SOR for the values going from 0 0.0 to 2 point right and I am taking 20 values in between it is going to run for 20 values and it is going to take 10 iterations is that fine I think I have really worn you guys out with this anyway okay let us see let me just run it and see what we get 
and uh, this S has an error which is the error versus omega right I have S has an omega those are the omega values that we ran and it has a set of errors is that fine okay right. So I will import just to plot it. just quickly do this okay and plot there we go right and any time we are plotting error we really need to this looks relatively flat okay this does not look that encouraging but then we go to the power of the log scale any time we plot error we always look at it on the log scale it does not look that flat now right. So it looks like whatever we are looking for this is important by the way so you have to look at it in the log scale whatever we are looking for the optimal omega value that we are looking for is somewhere there is everybody with me the optimal omega value that we are looking for is somewhere there. So let me hold that graph because I want to plot on top of it okay and I will uh, create another SOR solver for me okay but uh, okay let us go back to that graph now I want to hunt I want to try out another set okay so what value shall I take what values of omega where shall I hunt if I look at this graph where, where shall I hunt 1.52 well 1.2 you know is not going to is not going to do it 1.5 to 1.9 maybe right is conservative bear in mind when you are doing this that the convergence that you have is non uniform convergence that is what we want okay so this limit is going to drift right is that does that make sense does it seem does that or it is just going to continue down so 1.92 so I say uh, omega I will say w np dot I will create a vector the syntax is very similar to m grid from 1.5 to 1.9 and maybe we will take 10 samples instead of 20 okay 10 samples okay and I will create another SOR solver and pass it this omega. So S1 should run 10 iterations, S1 should run 10 iterations for and S1 also has an error so I will plot where is my plot S1 dot omega versus S1 dot error. Well, 10 iterations. What did you expect? I mean, it's going to be this. It's going to be the same thing. The only point is that the curve is smoother because we have more points. That's all that's happened. Okay. So, I fortunately I can go more. Right? So I have a. It'll go for a little more time. I have a little go more, which will go for a little more time, for 10 more iterations. So. And if I do that. Okay. Then I can plot that again and what do I get aha so it is it is better and it is a little sharper so it seems to be somewhere there okay it seems to be somewhere there is that okay uh, in fact what I will do I will get rid of I will get rid of some of this uh, some of this part or let it is okay let it, I get rid of some of this part so do not need okay it does not look as sharp because I have removed that part but right so it seems to be around what do you say well yeah I will be conservative still 1.65 okay that is 1.7 1.65 to 1.85 why, why, why risk it okay 
So now I go back and I set this from 1.65 to 1.85. I am doing this because this is a demo. I mean what you would do is you would, you would hunt for it maybe use bisection or something. You would hunt for it in a more systematic fashion. There are other ways by which we can do this. So now I will create a S2. So that does only 10, that is no, that's no good. So we will do an S2 go more. and we will plot S2. As you would expect it is the same, you have done it twice, it is the same, it is a smoother curve, we will do it some more. Fine, okay. So you can see it is getting tighter and it seems to be around uh, between 1.75 and 1.8. So it, it is possible for you, it is possible for you to actually hunt for an optimal omega, right? And trust me, this curve here is not going to move that that much. Okay. If I if I if I were to plot, if I were to do uh, just for the fun of it, if I were to run S, remember our friend S. There are 20 of them, so it will take a little more time. Maybe I will do it twice because I did the other one twice. Okay, if I were to plot this, uh -huh. I bet you do not know what happened. Okay. That is what you get. So it is very clear that when you when I say optimal omega, it is truly optimal omega. And look at this, look what is happening here. You picked a value because you took 20 samples, you picked a value there, you picked a value here. The, the optimal is actually somewhere in between. The optimal is actually somewhere in between. Okay. So you can look at this and get be under the uh, notion that it is at 1.6, actually it is not at 1.6, it is because of the way that you are taking samples. Okay. There is an idea, see you are looking at it and you, with your, your eye you are actually doing some kind of finite difference. Right? You are looking at you know, it is increasing here, decreasing there, you are looking at slopes, you are doing derivatives in your mind and uh, you get the impression that the minima by setting the derivative to 0 is somewhere here but actually it is somewhere to the right and because of non-uniform convergence it looks as though it is drifting to that, it is drifting to one side. Okay. So the hunt for the optimal, the hunt for the optimal value of omega has to be done a little carefully, right? But if you are going to make production runs, I am going to make uh, lots of runs, I am going to solve this Laplace equation for different boundary conditions, uh, you know, I am going to do 10,000 different boundary conditions. Then spending time finding that optimal omega makes a big difference because where here you are still at 1 point something, this is at point not 0.01 something. Right. In fact, it is point not not one something. Am I making sense? This is this minimum here. Just to give you an idea, is at point not not three. At omega equals one, it's at point three. Please remember, it's a log scale. At omega equals one, the residue is at point three. At omega equals one point eight, a one point seven five, the residue is at point not not three. It's running ten times faster. This is converging right now. It looks like ten times faster. Is that fine? Okay. And I casually made a uh, suggestion that uh, if you are changing boundary conditions, that you can find the optimal omega and find out uh, and solve for the various boundary conditions. Right. The question that you should pop to me immediately is: How do you know that the omega doesn't depend on the boundary conditions? Do you think that the omega will depend on the right-hand side? The optimal omega will depend on the right-hand side? Or does it just depend on the matrix A? If you are solving AX equals B using SOR, the question is does the omega, optimal omega depend on the right hand side or does it just uh, depend on the matrix A? Think back to that graph that I drew. 
right and the steepest descent uh, idea that we had which I mistakenly said Newton method at that time the steepest descent idea that I had okay fine okay. So I guess we will meet uh, in tomorrow's class I would suggest that you try out some of these things for yourself okay we will meet in tomorrow's class thank you.